So good garbage is garbage that finds a way to be utilized uh, in nature in, in a positive way. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Good Garbage Podcast. My name is Veth Krishna. My primary reason for existence has been to find ways to leave our wonderful planet cleaner. We will be speaking with material innovators, creators and propagators to learn from them how we can build for scale and towards a regenerative future. Their stories will help us answer the big question, what is good garbage? Brad Rogers has been an absolute trailblazer. He created the world's first compostable flexible packaging for PepsiCo for the Sunships brand back in 2010 when we weren't even thinking about things like this. I met him soon after that for the first time and was bowled over by his knowledge and clarity. He has eventually retired from PepsiCo and is now the Vice President of Technology at Danimer Scientific the world's largest BHA producer. He remains buoyant and optimistic as ever. Uh, as we get to hear all about Danimer's exploration in the application space, enjoy the conversation. I am so excited today to have Brad, who's a rock star in the field that we've been in. And Brad and I probably met about maybe 10 years back, Brad, when... Brad was actually the director of advanced research at PepsiCo. And way before anybody thought of compostable packaging, Brad, you were out there. So I want to start, I want to dive right in and welcome you to the show. But also along with that, I want to hear the story of the Sunships with PLA. How did that whole thing happen? So, yeah, I've been very fortunate to uh, have worked for some uh, some really good companies in my career. And uh Midway through my career, I'd, I'd started my career in the uh, the chemical industry, working for large chemical companies. Midway through my career, I made a change and went to work for uh, PepsiCo um, in their packaging department. And very early on in that process, a question was asked, you know, can we change this packaging material to something that's, you know, has a better environmental footprint uh, versus the uh, traditional flexible packaging that's used to package uh, snack chips in today? And, you know, nobody wanted that job, but I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. This is something different and exciting. So I, I snapped it up and, and, uh, and started searching for alternative materials uh, versus the traditional polyethylene and polypropylene materials that are used in flexible packaging today. And, and it was challenging. This was, gosh, back in the mid 2000s, 2006 timeframe. And there just wasn't a lot out there uh, other than this material known as PLA, which was, you know, starting to emerge as a commercially viable material. So I reached out to uh, the folks at, uh, at NatureWorks and uh, made some early connections. And, and uh, we started figuring out ways we could, you know, who were they working with to make films? And, and we, we got those films. We had to figure out how to get those films, you know, with barrier performance that was going to be acceptable for snack chips. And, so gosh, you know, probably three years later, we we finally came up with a, a a package that would work for snack chips, and in 2009 launched the world's first compostable snack food package at at uh, PepsiCo. So uh, in fact, for one of these awards sitting up here is a res was one of the things I received for for that uh, wow. PepsiCo. Yeah. So I was a uh, quite a uh, quite exciting time in my uh, career. I uh, got to work with a lot of people, got to meet a lot of people, and and like you say. It was the very much the beginning in or the very edge of, of the uh, the biopolymer uh, development. You know, at that point in time, what I quickly discovered was that, you know, commercially available was one material. Uh, and I tell people all the time, it was like having one crayon in your in your box. So, you know, you could draw a picture, you can make a package, um, but but it didn't fully meet all the you know attributes that the existing packaging did. You know, you fast forward to now and we're, you know, 15 plus years later and, you know, there's a lot more biopolymers out there and a lot more choices, a lot more crayons in the box, if you will. And uh, and we can make a much prettier picture now and a much better package than we could back then. So PepsiCo was definitely before its time. What what led it to kind of think about this direction, number one? And of course, I want you to continue the story because there was a lot of 
uh, what you told me, whatever, 10 years back was the sound, the crinkle of, of, of the sun chips. So, so both those things, what was PepsiCo's motivation? And then, of course, the impact and why, you know, I think you had to withdraw it even for some time. So I so would love to hear those things. Well, I mean, the, the question uh, for, you know, was just a, a CEO question. It was asked by, uh, at the time, the uh, head of uh, finance, she became the CEO, Indra Nui. Um, a wonderful lady and, and just asked a very, you know, open-ended, smart CEO type question. You know, how do we how do we make this package better? How do we make it disappear at the end of life when consumers are finished with the product inside? So a simple question, but a very complex answer had to be derived. And, and um, so um, that was what started it all. And then when you started digging into what needed to be done to make it happen, PepsiCo was not uh, fearful of of backing that with, uh, you know, some research dollars to go and, and do some development efforts uh, against that. So, um, um, you know, I give them a lot of credit, a lot of uh, applause. And again, a great time in my career because I got to be right there in the middle of it all, you know, you know, steering the ship where we wanted to try to go. And uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. PepsiCo has, a, has to, you know, deserves a lot of credit for the foresight to be thinking about that. Indra Nui deserves a lot of credit for, you know, asking the right questions and then and then supporting it with financial funding to make it happen. Because any development that's, you know, crazy outside the box, you know, it doesn't just happen. It, it takes effort and takes uh, a lot of uh, willpower and uh, and it takes it took a lot of people to to pull it all together. I was just one of them uh, and I had a lot of help with me, uh, had a good team around me. And, uh, and had a lot of good suppliers that, that stepped up to the plate to, uh, to help, um, you know, really accomplish the goal of, of making that package. So a um, lot, of, lot of accolades all the way around. And what were the performance challenges when that came out? Of course, this is 15 years back. But, uh, you know, apart from what I remember talking to you about was the sound, but were there other performance challenges in terms of barriers as well? Absolutely. I mean, um, the nature of a lot of these biopolymer materials, and um, especially when you're dealing just one at that particular time, uh, poly uh, lactic acid (PLA), you know it's a, uh, a hydrophilic material. Uh, it likes water, and you know we're packaging a chip, a snack food chip that's very dry and likes a desert environment, uh, so it doesn't want to see water. So uh, you know you got to fix the package so that it keeps that water from passing straight through right to the chip. Um, so we had to work on that, and we spent a lot of time developing that with uh, with a lot of industry partners, some really good film suppliers uh, uh, that were out there. Uh, Torre, SK uh, uh, were, were two uh, major uh, suppliers that, that really put a lot of effort into developing materials that would uh, would work for that application and 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 help us meet that uh, performance goal of barrier and sealing performance, all the things that you need to make a package work. None of those things could be sacrificed. I mean, we couldn't, you know, if, if a consumer wants a nice crispy chip, they want a nice crispy chip, you know, and the package needs to perform to protect the chip appropriately. So that was a, uh, you know, a no non-starter. It had to, it had to meet those performance criteria. And then on top of that, we wanted it to, you know, be compostable, you know, working with PLA, it was definitely a, a compostable material, but we had to, we had to work with the ink suppliers to get ink systems that would work. We had to work with the adhesive suppliers to get adhesives that would that would meld the two uh, layers of the films together, and and all those had to be compostable and 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 not uh, mess up the um, uh, the end of life. So you know, a lot of industry folks had to come in to play in this, um, and that's why it took you know a good three or four years just to bring that initial product to market. But you know, because you're only dealing with one material, you know, you only got so many degrees of freedom to work with. PLA by nature is a very stiff and rigid product. And as a result, you wound up with a kind of a, a, a crispy sounding bag, if you will. Uh, and that was a, a little bit of a negative to, to some folks. You know, and again, fast forward to now, there's a lot more options. And, and, uh, and a lot of those uh, technical challenges have been, you know, they're far in the past now. So, you know, I liken it to the, that was the, uh, the BlackBerry. It was a start, but now everybody has an iPhone. So now we're in the iPhone age. So we've got a lot more tools in our hands, a lot more technology in our hands. <laughs> and there are the Samsungs and everything and, and, else. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but nobody, knows, nobody remembers what a BlackBerry was, right? <laughs> but it started the whole Absolutely. revolution, right? 
True, true. And uh, it's interesting to hear that because obviously when we were talking uh, and you told me that, you know, if somebody would open the Pareto chip bag in a cinema hall, everybody would know. <laughs> and that was the huge challenge with the with the PLA. And it's interesting to hear that story. And I want to kind of step back a little bit in your life. You chose polymer chemistry uh, when you were doing your undergrad. Yes. What led you to that? And then, of course, your history with working with different polymers, with the petroleum industry, and, you know, how did that train you to where you are today? Uh, you know, good history. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, bringing that up. I uh, I was very fortunate early in my career, um, you know, early in my life, I, I figured out I liked math and science. So, you know, that's what I did, excelled at in uh, junior high and high school era. And, and when it came time to go to college, you know, I started studying chemical engineering you know, good basic background and in, in, in chemistry and, and math and, and really melded all those things together well. And and about a year and a half into my uh, college career, um, one of my uh, good friend's father actually owned a, a small chemical company. They made uh, coatings for uh, for uh, fiberglass products, uh, bass boats, gel coats uh, for you know fishing boats and, and for, you know, sport boats, that kind of thing. Uh, um, a lot of applications for, for these types of materials. Well, he was the only guy I knew that had a, you know, any kind of engineering background. And, and so I chatted with him and he told me about this wonderful world of plastics and introduced me to uh, a professor that he knew at the uh, University of Missouri at Rolla. And uh, I switched gears and went from chemical engineering into plastics and, and never have looked back since. So I, I studied plastics through my undergrad and uh, and then came out of school, worked for the small company uh, from my friend's father for a couple of years. Um, and then opportunity came knocking with large chemical companies like Chevron. And I got the chance to go work for, uh, you know, a major manufacturer of polyethylene. Got a chance to go work for a major manufacturer of polypropylene, uh, Lindell Bissell. And, uh, and, and, and really had a wonderful first part of my career in, in the uh, in the conventional plastics industry. And I got to work with a lot of the pioneers. When I first started in that industry, uh, a lot of the guys that I worked with were, you know, 40 year guys that, you know, they were there when the plastics industry first started. So these guys, um, you know, invented polyethylene and polypropylene. In fact, I worked for one of the guys who, you know, was, was one of the lab techs for uh, Julio Nada. Um, who who invented polypropylene. So the connections were right back to the very early stages of, of, of the polymer industry. And, um, and and I got to learn a lot from those guys, a ton. Uh, these guys were great teachers. Uh, and I say guys because at that time in the industry, it was mainly men. <laughs> and then the opportunity came along to come to work for PepsiCo and, and you know, I shifted gears. And, and then that led to exploring next generation of polymers and and now that's led me to working for one of my favorite uh, biopolymer companies, uh, Danimer Scientific. So it's kind of a nice circle. And now I'm the old guy on the other end of the uh, of the spectrum, uh, getting to work with a bunch of young guys uh, that are developing these new materials, and and uh, and hopefully we can we can make them uh, commercially successful like uh, the predecessors were. Yeah, and maybe 20 years down, one of those will be in on a podcast saying the same thing about you. I had great teachers. <laughs> I, I hope. I hope. I, I try the best I can. I'm sure you do, Brad. So talk to me a little more about that experience of petroleum-based substrates. And I'm sure it helps you today understanding, you know, the details of melt flow index and, you know, all the different uh, polymer chemistry uh, that happened then. And um, I'm sure it, it influences your thinking now and probably makes your life a little bit easier than somebody who hasn't experienced that side of it. So talk to me about what is, how does that experience help in the current situation when you're developing numerous substrates uh, in the biopolymer space? Sure. Well, I mean, polymer chemistry is, is definitely understanding the, uh, the fundamentals of, of you know, crystallinity, morphology, uh, molecular weight, molecular weight distribution, how these uh, materials and how these these properties interact to to make a material, you know, tougher or more flexible or more or more rigid like. All of these uh, uh, physical properties are, are very important. 
and and they've been studied um, and I got to work with a lot of the folks that you know really pioneered the way to to analyze these uh, these conventional polymers. Uh, now the nice thing about polyethylene and polypropylene is they're very simple polymers. It's ethylene over and over and over again, or it's propylene over and over and over again. And then maybe we do something creative and we throw in a side branch and we copolymerize it with a, uh, uh, a sister material that, that gives it a little bit of branching and then that, that changes some of the properties. But in the end, you know, that polymer science is very simple. It's, it's, it's simple building blocks that you're just putting together one after the other. And so that, but those fundamentals are still there. You know, you got to understand those fundamentals and those fundamentals still apply to more complex polymers and biopolymers it can be you know quite complex by comparison uh, there's a, a wide range of nature is, has the capability of making fantastic polymers uh, and they've been practicing at it for you know millions of years to make some of these polymers and, and that's everything from you know an apple skin to uh, you know an orange peel to um, the pha materials that, that microbes use as as a food source you know, these are all polymeric materials that nature has been making forever. And now we're just starting to understand how do we use these in new ways and how do we find ways to extract them from nature, encourage nature to make them in larger patterns. But in the end, the fundamental principles of crystallinity, morphology, you know, uh, molecular weight, molecular weight distribution, all that interplays with melt flow. How does the polymer flow and, and, and process all of those things are still fundamentals that have to be measured and understood, but you're doing it on a much more complex polymer. So it's fun. <laughs> it's challenging. Uh, it, sometimes you, you're banging your head against the wall going, why does nature do that? You know, but, but I also keep reminding myself that nature, God is a much better polymer engineer than any of us will ever be. So uh, there's there's probably a reason for that the structures that the way they're put together and we just have to understand them is all. No, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And I think they say 3.6 billion years, <laughs> so it's a lot of head start for nature to kind of evolve its uh, polymer science, right? So how did how did the PepsiCo shift happen from a petroleum engineer working in the space of polymers and suddenly PepsiCo gets to you and say, come and join us. And I presume that was primarily with the packaging idea, but how did that shift happen and what was the journey in PepsiCo like? Because you were clearly, like I said in the introduction, you were clearly one of the trailblazers for the packaging industry. It's a funny story, actually. I mean, uh, I've been working in the chemical industry for 15 years, living in South Texas, um, raising my family there. Uh, my lovely wife, Jeanette, you know, was helping raise three kids and, you know, we, we had a life and we were, you know, happy. But, you know, there was also this desire to get out of Southeast Texas uh, where the chemical, chemical industry is pretty dominant down there. It's pretty much, that's it. It's all chemical industry. When you go to parties, everybody works for similar companies. It's the same conversation over and over again. Everybody's doing the same type of stuff. It's, it, 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 it just, you know, it was time for a change. And, one day I came home and uh, my wife had been looking on uh, monster.com. That was a, that was a way you found jobs back in the day. And uh, she shows me this job uh, opportunity up in Dallas and Dallas was certainly a city that, you know, we, we were attracted to. And um, I said, that looks good. I think I could do that job. And, and my wife told me, well, good. Cause I've already sent your resume in. And uh, so I never even sent my resume to Pepsi, uh, but they got my resume and a week later, they gave me a call and somehow my name got picked out of a hat of, you know, thousands of applicants. And uh, so I was uh, very fortunate. And I and I blame a lot of that on the, uh, you know, the industry connections that I had to um, the supply chain that, that supplies companies like PepsiCo. The upstream chemical industry makes a lot of the base materials. And I was working in an applications development role, working with a lot of customers that were you know, developing packaging materials for companies like PepsiCo and, you know, Mars and, Qu you know, Quaker and all the other uh, major CPG companies uh, that are that are out there. They felt like I'd be a good fit. So uh, I was I was happy to take the role and and move to Dallas. And I've been here ever since. 
So the award is actually for Jeanette and not you. Is that what you're the trying to is, say? My wife, Jeanette. <laughs> so I give her all the credit. She hears it all the time. So one must uh, give her credit for everything she does. So I'm happy, happy to have her as my spouse. Oh, absolutely. In fact, it reminded me of a story of my parents and my father when he started a little paper company back in India. Uh, my mother actually, he didn't have any money, no seed capital. So my mother at that time just sold off all her jewelry and gave him the initial seed capital. See? And uh, and and so my father would always say till his dying day, he would say that actually the company belongs to your mother. We are just trustees because the person who gives the seed capital is actually the owner of the company. So, so you know, that's something that would stay with me uh, forever, you know, because it was just brought up so many times when my father was always so thankful about having her. Uh, by his side. Tell me more, Brad, about the journey at PepsiCo. Was it for a role for packaging? And uh, how did that whole role evolve? Because, of course, I saw you at various industry conferences looking at packaging, and you were always curious about exploring new forms of packaging and trying to evolve. Uh, so what was the role, and did it kind of uh, stay with packaging, or was it wider than that? Yeah, the... Um... I I was fortunate to come into a packaging role at Pepsi, and I was in a position where they wanted to take advantage of my uh, industry knowledge of the uh, of the resin industry, the plastics industry, back upstream from their traditional film, you know, printers, the converters that make all the packaging materials, and actually get a layer or two deeper into the process. And and so that was the role I was in. I was working closely with a lot of the suppliers to PepsiCo and, you know, discussing materials that, that they were utilizing, ways they can improve those materials, that kind of thing. So it was really uh, an applications development role, but on the end of the of the supply chain versus the beginning of the supply chain. Um, and so I did that for a few years. And then this opportunity, this question was asked by Indra, uh, you know, can we make the package, you know, better, have a better end of life? I was the only... Um, you know, like I say, I was the only fool that raised my hand and said, I'll take that job uh, because it sounded fun. It just sounded, you know, you know, exciting and, and I could go explore. And then the more I explored, the, you know, the more questions came up. And again, because more questions came up and because Pepsi had a, uh, a stomach for exploring, uh, they also, um, you know, provided funding to go to that. And, and, and with funding, you can go grow a group and you can build a, a whole organization. So that's kind of what happened is we built a uh, organization and I always got to be part of that. Uh, others were as well. And we grew a, a really strong organization of, of industry experts. There's a lot of good folks still at PepsiCo uh, and that have left PepsiCo and gone elsewhere that all came through that organization. It was what Pepsi termed their advanced research team. So they set this group up to, uh, to look at you know, what's on the horizon, what's out there five years from now, 10 years from now, um, and how do we, you know, how do we pull it forward? How do we go find it and bring it forward so we can use it, you know, sooner rather than wait for it to happen on its own? And um, and so, again, I, I applaud their foresight into thinking about these types of things, their intelligence of going out and hiring a lot of smart people, a lot of people way smarter than me. I mean, I got to work with some really, really sharp scientists and chemists uh, in this program. And as a result, we explored and, and found a lot of new technologies. And now those technologies are all starting to come to um, to commercial reality. So uh, um, it's been fun to be on that journey. Yeah, no, definitely a lot of foresight there. And I'm going to jump to uh, where you are now as, as uh, the VP of technology in Tanimer. And I know there's a fun story behind that. So, you know, let's shift to that story on uh, what what little I know is that you know you visited them way back. It wasn't it wasn't new, and you know it was kind of revealing for you to come from a big company and visit Danimer. So so tell us the the the, the journey with uh, how it started, how you met the Danimer guys uh, initially, and then of course how you transitioned into Danimer. I got to go on one of my scouting visits, uh, and I did this a lot when I was working in this uh, this advanced research group at Pepsi, um, and I'd go visit companies and. And, you know, you'd kick a lot of tires and you'd uh, you'd walk into a lot of shops. And some of these shops were, were you know, literally a guy's garage. I mean, working on something new. But, but, you know, that's where Microsoft started. That's where Apple started. I mean, you know, a lot of great things come out of small places. And uh, 
And one of those companies was Danimer. I walked into uh, their shop. They were in, uh, based in Bainbridge, Georgia. And Bainbridge, Georgia, for context, is in the far south uh, west corner of Georgia. It's about 30 minutes north of Tallahassee, uh, Florida. So you're kind of in the middle of a very rural, very small town environment. And you pull up and here's this little tiny, like two little metal buildings. I mean, not much bigger than two small garages. And that was their lab and their offices. And that was it. But, you know, it had a handful of really smart guys there. And I could tell they were doing some really interesting chemistry work in these labs. And I got to talking to them and understanding more about what they were doing and exploring it. And, and you could see that, you know, it had a bright future, but it was very, very early on. I mean, they were making you know, cupfuls of, of plastic, <laughs> you know, so I, I, you know, I took that information back and I watched and I, you know, you know, let them grow, let them, let them mature a little bit. And then after a few years, I, I was able to bring some other colleagues of mine from, uh, from PepsiCo to visit and, uh, and they'd grown up a bit more and, and certainly made, you know, a lot more advancements in their technology and their capabilities. And, and now they started looking like a, a company that could start to supply, you know, a new material that, um, you know, that just didn't exist, you know, before uh, commercially. And, and, and so that, that, that led to a lot closer, you know, R&D relationship that was developed. Um, Pepsi and, and, um, and Danimer formed a, um, a joint development agreement soon after that. And, uh, and then we started working very closely with them to, you know, drive some development work towards uh, making a, 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 a better compostable uh, snack food package. Anyhow, fast forward a few more years, and I decided it was time to, uh, you know, leave the big corporate world. I've been, you know, I've been involved with major big corporations for, you know, 30 plus years of my career. And, you know, I won't say it had gotten old. It just, you know, it was time for a change. Um, and I wanted to finish my career working for, uh, you know, a small company again um, and, and hopefully uh, help that small company, you know, turn into a, uh, a major player in the uh, in the in this emerging biopolymer world, and uh, Danimer had certainly remained a friend of mine for a long period of time. And uh, the the, uh, the folks that I knew there had asked me, Phil Phil Van Trump, Scott Tooten, you know, the uh, CTO and, and CMO of the company, uh, and two guys that I met early on when they were in that little small building working, uh, you know, asked me to come and, and and play with them in this in this area. So um, that's what I'm doing on the on the back half of my, or back third of my career. I would say I divided into thirds, chemical industry, <laughs> the world, and now biochemical industry. It's so, so interesting that you say that just as a color corollary uh, in India, their life is divided into four yeah. quarters. And then it's, it's again, it has significance, you know, that how you build yourself in the first, you build your family in the next, you let go in the third, and then you go out into the forest in the fourth. So, you know, in the side, oh, go into, like, like they say, you know, into the dawn of uh, kind of uh, dusk of life, not dawn, dusk of uh, life, you know. So, so, you know, it's that. So while you were talking about dividing it in thirds, it's kind of a good corollary to that uh, system and, and thinking. Uh, so two more questions there. So in terms of your desire for sustainability, was that kind of raised when you worked with all these advanced material did you already have that as, as an essence by the time you thought about Danimer? And second, uh, by the time you, because I know that Danimer initially, I know that they bought a, um, initially from PNG, I think they bought the initial PHA technology and had that kind of, that been the initial idea and that evolved or was that a different direction that it had taken yep. uh, uh, from the PNG product? Yeah, so to begin with, I mean, in my my life, I, mean, I grew up in in rural Arkansas, um, and you know, some of my family are farmers and have a background and and you know, working with the land and and so it's kind of always been ingrained that you know you just make things from what you got, you know, and and you know it, it was these were very humble beginnings, trust me. Early in one of my uh, uh, I guess chemical engineering classes, I had to take a course in ethics. And I remember taking a, uh, this, uh, you know, this course and, and it was all about, you know, why engineers and scientists uh, need to be responsible with what they do uh, because, you know, you can have a positive impact on the world or you can, you can have a really detrimental impact 
across wide ranges. And, you know, and there's all the examples of, you know, you know, uh, deforestation and, and uh, of course, of, of uh, you know, polluting the environment with toxic chemicals and what that does. And, 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 and these are decisions that the engineers and the scientists play a role in, right? Because you're deciding, should I use this or should I use that? And, and so you're making those early decisions. And so it's important that you make good ones. So that was a, that was a fundamental lesson that I was taught early in my career. And, and, um, and then as you advance further into your career and go through it and, and you're working for these large chemical companies and, and, and then, it, then working for a large uh, consumer goods company, you know, you, you suddenly those chances to impact the, uh, the decisions and, and the choices that those companies make starts to reveal itself. And you, you start to have that, that role in your career. And, and, and so you're helping to shape where the company is going by choosing this material or this package or this style of manufacturing over this other style. And, and, and those are choices that you have to fundamentally make. And, and so if you base some of that on, on to, you know, what's better for the environment as part of that equation, you also have to factor in, you know, cost and, and performance and, you know, it's got to work. And, and it's, it, but if you can also do that and have it be environmentally friendly, um, well, then those are better choices. And so that just started early in, in that, uh, that part of my career. And, and it just continues to build and build and build. And so moving towards Danimer, Danimer has a, um, you know, at their, at their center of who they are, the, um, the fundamental philosophy of, of making a material that is better for the environment. Uh, that's fundamental to, to Danimer's philosophy. And, uh, and so I, I believe in that and, and I'm encouraged by that. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman who, who worked for P and G, uh, Dr. Noda, um, after he retired from Procter and Gamble, he was the gentleman who, who actually invented this process, uh, for making, uh, uh, PHA. Um, and really it's what it is. It's a, it's a process for leveraging nature to make the PHA. And then we just harvest it from what nature is making. And then what Danimer has done is they've taken that technology forward. Dr. Noda now sits on our board at, uh, at Danimer uh, after he retired from P&G and he serves as a scientific advisor to us. So he's got to see his technology go from, you know, laboratory all the way through to, you know, large commercial scale that we are at today and hopefully even larger in the future. And so that's got to be a very proud moment for him too. He's had a wonderful career of seeing, you know, a technology that he worked on early, early in his career come to, to light and, and to come to fruit in the back end of his career. What we've done is taken that technology, that fundamental technology for making PHA or nature makes the PHA. We just figured out how to encourage it to happen at a faster rate and at a larger scale uh, and all in one place at one time. <laughs> so that's really all we've done is we've created an environment for microbes to to uh, turn fatty acids, oils, into PHA, which they do naturally all the time. Um, and we just, you know, encourage them to do it at a very fast rate uh, so that we can make this, uh, you know, industrially uh, possible. And we do that with just heat and temperatures and, and creating the right environment, pH and, uh, you know, the right nutrients and such so that the microbes want to consume the oil and it's like they're having a Thanksgiving feast and then they fatten up and they get really fat and they, they've stored all this PHA in their body and now we harvest it. And then the process for harvesting it uh, has been refined to the point where we can get a very, very clean, pure PHA powder out uh, with no residual um, uh, microbial uh, residue left over. Um, and, um, and now we've got a clean polymer to work with and now we can take that and modify it to, uh, to work for various, you know, applications like injection molding or film or, you know, thermoforming or whatever application that we're, we're developing a polymer for. Yeah, it's brilliant too. I, I can't even begin to understand how this happens. So I don't even try because it's so complex in some ways, you know, how microbes do it and how you feed vegetable oil to it. And then, you know, uh, the whole journey of that. But while you were speaking, there was a story that came to my mind and you were talking about your roots in Arkansas. And I was listening to this podcast and the guy talked about how he only hires farmers' children. And he said, why he does that is because they basically 
develop the work ethic right from the beginning. Because if they have to wake up at five and go and, you know, whatever, clear the dung or <laughs> milk the cows or whatever, they do it. And they are put to that task. That's just the way they live. And that was interesting when you were talking about it. Now, I, I, I got to I gotta understand where does Brad's work ethic come from? <laughs> come from. It's back at the farm. <laughs> so that was super interesting to hear. My uh, stepdad was a uh, peach farmer. And uh, I worked on that for a few years in my life. And just enough to know that, man, that's hard work. And it is. It's before the sun comes up and it's after the sun goes down every day. And you just, hey, that's hard work. So, yeah, this is a lot more fun. <laughs> not that that's not appreciated because I do love be- <laughs> eating good peaches. Exactly. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Come on. I love eating, eating good, good peaches. peaches. And, and, uh, and I miss the fact that, uh, that my uh, pop's farm is no longer in existence because they were the best. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but I do want to learn a little more and elaboration of the technology in a little more detail. I mean, the base substance and the fermentation process, and maybe how does it differ from PLA? Because PLA is also fermentation, but it seems like a very different tangentially kind of different process while still being fermentation. So it'll be interesting for you to draw parallels for mine and the listeners understanding. Sure. So, um, you know, I'll start with PLA. So PLA, you 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 ferment the sugars to make the lactic acid, which is the base monomer, to then polymerize into polylactic acid. Um, and that polymerization process is more of a traditional condensation type of reaction, like you would use in traditional polymerization programs. So once you get the the monomer, which is coming from fermentation then you can polymerize it via more conventional polymerization techniques. The process for making PHA contrasts with that because the each individual microbe, each, each individual bug is its own little mini reactor. So it takes in the, uh, the vegetable oil. Um, and there's other, there's other feedstocks that can be utilized as well. There's other microbes that will convert you know, uh, methane or other gases, you just got to have that carbon source. Uh, we use a vegetable oil in our process. We feed that to the microbes. The microbes that we have are selective. They like that my, that, that uh, vegetable oil. They'll eat it up. And then inside their body, they convert that uh, vegetable oil to PHA because they see PHA as a way to store food. So they've got way more vegetable oil than they need to eat. And they're just consuming it up because we created an environment that that microbe just says in his little miniature, there's no brain. It's just a single cell organism, but in his body, it, it says eat. And so he eats and he eats excess and he stores the excess as PHA. And then at some point in the future, you know, when times were, were be rough, he would have that food to go draw off of and he could, he would have a food source. So we just don't let that happen because now once he's fattened up, we, cut it off and we, we suck the fat out of the, out of the microbe and then uh, clean it up and purify it. And now you've got a pure PHA, but because it's a, a seen as a food store for microbes when it goes back to nature. So when that PHA then winds up back in the environment, whether that be in a compost bin or, or a home composting pile, or, or if it accidentally, you know, winds up in the environment through litter or, or just, you know, inadvertently winds up in, you know, in the ocean or on the land, microbes will seek it out and they will find that PHA and they will consume it because they see it as food. It's always seen as food and it's seen as a readily available food. So they really prefer eating it versus other things because it's, it's a high energy source of food for microbes. So that's why it's, it's, it's a universally biodegradable material. Uh, the interesting thing about PHA is it's one of the few biopolymers that's on the market today that is biodegradable in literally almost every environment possible. Uh, I mean, if it's in the Arctic, you know, frozen tundra, n- nothing biodegrades there because there's no microbes. But as long as you're in an environment where there's there's microbial activity, microbes will seek it out and, and, and see it as a food source and consume it. So, so, of course, uh, and I'm told our bodies do the same as well. Microbes within our body will, of course, help our digestive process. And I'm told maybe they create PHA. But how did Dr. Noda come out with this? This is kind of way out there to create it on an industrial thing or even imagine that 
So, so would you know the genesis of this thought? Have you ever talked to him and asked him, you know, how did you ever imagine that this could be recreated in an industrial environment? It's a great question. I have not had that conversation personally with him. Um, I'd like to someday, uh, but that would be a fascinating discussion to have. Um, I, I'm sure there was something that was the genesis of the idea that, that sparked it and then, uh, and then led him to create the, uh, the process. And then um, all we've done at Danimer is take that basic knowledge and then refine it and, you know, develop it further so that it's, you know, the next generation, third generation of that, of that technology to where it's at today. Uh, but it is quite complex. Um, and again, I'm, I'm fortunate to be working with a company now. Danimer has done a really good job of, of hiring a, a, a very large pool of, of uh, talented, um, capable engineers and scientists, um, all from various parts of the uh, traditional chemical industry, as well as the uh, biological uh, sciences. And um, we, we, you know, there's about 280 of us. So still a small company by comparison to, you know, a Chevron or a like we're used or to like, PepsiCo. <laughs> yeah, or PepsiCo. I mean, yeah, we're still a tiny company. Uh, but, you know, each of these guys and, and, and ladies, uh, men and women are very uh, talented and bring a lot to the table to uh, to help make that process better. Uh, so I'm very fortunate to be working with some really, really talented folks now that are that are taking that initial spark of an idea and turning it into a commercially viable process for producing, you know, large scale uh, runs of PHA. Um, and um, and that's exciting, you know, because this, I think it's one of the materials that needs to come into the world. Um, but we got a long way to go uh, before it's at the scale that, you know, the rail cars that leave every single day from every single chemical plant on the Gulf Coast of, of Texas or, or, you know, the Middle East or, or parts of China, where, you know, all over the world where there's large pockets of industrially produced, uh, uh, you know, polyethylene, polypropylene, PET, all the conventional uh, plastic materials, they're produced at such large scales. Um, we're a long way from that, but we're a lot closer today than we were yesterday. So we, every day, you know, we just keep getting a little bit bigger and, you know, and, and as consumers start to recognize these materials as viable alternatives and we start to find homes for them, we'll continue to build processes that, that make this stuff even faster and even, even larger scales. Oh, it's just a brilliant, brilliant uh, start for sure. What, what Danica has been doing is spectacular. The Good Garbage Podcast has been brought to you by PACA. PACA has been creating solutions in the food packaging, carry and service space. PACA utilizes sugarcane residue and upcycles it into amazing products. Their latest offering is a compostable, flexible packaging solution for the chocolate and confectionery industry. The products are available in the Indian subcontinent and in North America now. PACA is also building an end-to-end -end solutions for customers in the food service and delivery space. For any query, do email at connect at PACA.com and PACA is P-A-K-K-A. -A. Do you have something to add to the conversation? Use hashtag good garbage to add your own insights, ideas and opinions on regenerative packaging and zero waste solutions. Now let's get back to the conversation. You were talking about degradation and uh, staying with that uh, thought process. Uh, do you like, again, this is more education for me and the listeners. Um, in terms of the polylactic acid, they always say industrially compostable. In PHA, most times they would say biodegrades, like you said, anywhere. It could be home, it could be industrial. And is that because of that same idea that if there's an individual microbe kind of creating the fat and they want to eat it? How does the degradation process differ in PLA versus PHA? That's good. Uh, good question. So for for PLA, you've got to hydrolyze it and actually kind of break it down just a little bit. And that's what the industrial compost will do because in an industrial compost environment, you have heat and moisture as well as microbial activity all present. So the heat and the moisture act first and hydrolyze the polymer so that it breaks down to a little bit smaller pieces. And then the microbe can see that uh, lactic acid, you know, smaller chain polymer 
as a uh, as a food source. Uh, begin because lactic acid is you know produced by microbes and it's you know readily available as a food source. It's in our body today. Um, so um, it's a uh, uh, it, but it just has to get to be a smaller molecule before the microbe will actually chew it up. Whereas PHA is already naturally a polymerized large uh, long chain molecule that the, the microbe already sees as a food source. So he can, the microbe can uh, attack it and enzymatically, um, you know, break the polymer down into uh, its, you know, base components, which is carbon dioxide and water is what it turns into. And the result is the microbe gets the energy from it. So in that process. So that's that's the you know biological process that that they've been that microbes have been using since microbes have been on you know planet Earth. Um, so uh, uh, PHA just happens to be one of those materials. Starch is another material that is seen as a similar food source. Um, cellulose is another. So there's there's lots of you know natural occurring polymers that microbes see as food. PHA is one of them, and it's uh, and it's one that they they really like. They find it very tasty, is what I like to say. They, if it's on the dinner menu, they're coming to eat it. <laughs> Super. We should we should at some point park it side by side: cellulose, starches, PHA, and say which one they go for first. <laughs> well, and, <laughs> which is the menu? And and you know, there's there's a wide range of microbes. So some microbes like uh, one more than true. the other, and, yeah. and, and but yeah, but. But there's yeah. there's an abundance of microbes and, that like PHA and and they're everywhere. I mean they're all over the earth. So you don't have to go find yeah. them. You don't yeah. have to specifically inoculate <laughs> it. it. They're there's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, when we look at the microbes, are they one of course you're choosing the kind of microbes I presume which will like this source, and then uh, that will be that will, that is probably an art and science on its own. And the second part of that is are the microbes are you able to reuse the microbes or it's flushed out each time uh, you extract the fat out? How does that work? Choosing the microbe and then reusing the microbe. Perfect. Yeah. So microbes, um, um, you know, there's, you know, thousands of microbes in, in the world, millions of microbes in the world. And uh, what we've done is we found the, the types of microbes that produce PHA um, naturally. And we've identified those. And that's a lot of the science that was going on. So when I first met, you know, Danimer 15 plus years ago, I mean, there was a lot of biology going on, just trying to figure out which microbes, you know, make which grades of PHA. And um, and that takes time. You know, it's a lot of screening. It's a lot of processing. It's a lot of trial and error, um, you know, figuring out which microbes like it. Then once you identify those microbes, you store those microbes. So now you've got certain grades of microbes. And this is where the, uh, the biology science comes in. And, and I'm going to be a lot less educated in. But the basics of it are, you get a, um, a, a pool of the microbes that make a certain grade of, of uh, PHA and you store those. And then all you need is to take a little, you know, you know, you know, small little amount of those microbes, put it into a Petri dish, grow them up, get it into a vessel and then grow them into that school because microbes reproduce over and over and over again. Once you've got a sufficient quantity of them, you dump it into the large tank. And, uh, and then you set up an environment so that those microbes just want to eat. And, uh, and now you start feeding them a whole bunch of uh, vegetable oil and they swell up and they grow in the tank. And then, and then at the end of that process, which takes about, oh, 48 to 50 something hours, um, you, you cut the process off. And then unfortunately, the microbes have to sacrifice their their existence, but they're not going to live much longer anyways. They have short lifespans anyways. And you, uh, you cut that off and then you uh, extract the, uh, the PHA from there. But you always keep a, a, a source of those microbes, you know, on ice. So we have a, a large bank. Uh, in fact, I think we have a duplicate bank in two places so that we'll never lose the microbes that make different grades of PHA. And we know which microbes to pull out to make which grades of PHA we want to make and for a particular run and we produce that and then we then we set up another run right behind it and you just keep repeating the cycle over and over again and we, when you say different grades is it to do with the molecular length uh, the chain length or it is to do with the malleability how do you decide that this will create this type of uh, 
polymer and this will create a different kinds of polymer and is that just by view of experience and experimentation that that evolves you know and i'm also told there's pha there's phb there is phbv and you know all those and those are fundamentally molecular lengths right so how does how does that differ yep that's exactly right i mean there's there, pha is a family of polymers um so you know pha is just a generic term for the whole family of them but yes it's all different chain links and and different side branches that these uh these uh, um, uh, microbes can produce. And so, yeah, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, it's a lot of science too. I mean, the biologist will know a lot more about selecting which microbes will make which grades of PHA uh, than I know. But, but, but we do know that what comes out or what, what you put into the reactor then produces the specific grades of PHA that we were looking for. So as long as you keep that, the microbes, you know, colony pure, so they're all the same, you know, type of microbe, and they're eating the same vegetable oil under the same conditions, they will produce a particular grade of PHA. Um, and whether that be PHA, PHBB, PHBX, uh, uh, I mean, whatever the chain link that we're looking for. And the, the number of comonomer uh, side chains. So we can make a wide range from very, very, you know, straight chain crystalline PHAs uh, to very amorphous, uh, highly branched, uh, very elastomeric type of PHAs. Um, and we figured out which microbes can do, you know, produce which grades. Um, we can do all of that in our small laboratory pilot facilities. In our production facilities, we focus on probably, you know, three, four, maybe five different grades that we want to produce, you know, regularly, because those are the ones that have the properties that we're looking for to make the types of materials that our customers want to buy. And so the microbes, I guess, have to be in continuous production because if they're going to lose their lives at the end of uh, the extraction, then you have to keep introducing new microbes. And that would be another part of the production process where you're continuously multiplying microbes, yep. right? But they, they do that. I mean, you just keep them. Oh, they would do that. Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. It's like spores in a way, like, you know, the, the mycelium spores, they keep kind of multiplying. And I guess it's a similar, I, like, I I presume it's the similar kind of mechanism of uh, multiplication. Microbes uh, reproduce by, you know, dividing and, you know, they just keep dividing and dividing. So, you know, one to two to four to eight. And, and so they grow into, you know, vast multiples very, very rapidly. So you only need a small amount to start. And in a very short period of time, you can have millions of billions of microbes in a, in a pool. And then you start feeding them the uh, oil and then they fatten up and then you've got thousands of tons of, uh, of, of PHA that get produced. And then, and then you, then you just redo the whole process over and over again. So what you're doing is you're just keeping a, a system of setup of, of tanks that are in various stages of growth, if you will, an early tank where microbes are just got introduced and you're now, now putting in the, uh, the, the food source, the vegetable oil, and then later on you've got tanks that are midway through the process and then some that are completing the process. And then you just keep cycling them back over and over and over again. So it's a continuous batch process, uh, but by how, is how you produce these uh, uh, these at large scale. And that's kind of the creative genius about it, you know. Yeah, figuring it's out absolutely how to do all fascinating. That, uh, and make it at a large scale production, you know, in huge tanks uh, and uh, and large scale, you know, uh, you know, polymer processing capability. So um, this is this looks when you go to one of our factories, it looks like a I won't say as large as a big chemical plant in Houston, but it looks like a small chemical plant in Houston. You yeah, and it's basically tanks on tanks. So, so tanks. you're not going to see what is inside. So all you're going to see from the outside is tanks. Tanks and pipes. Yeah. <laughs> tanks and pipes. Yeah. yeah, and and I'm sure, like you know, that this is fascinating. What what Dr. Noda did, and you know how it evolved. But um, I'm sure there's a lot of science that happens. And I'm, I keep wondering, how did he figure this out initially? And I hope that at some time, either you or hopefully me as well, we will ask him on how that happened. But uh, but once you've taken out the, um, the 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 creation from the tanks, there must be a lot of experimentation that may take place to convert it to a biopolymer after that. And how does that happen? Is that just purification, drying, or is there more to it? in terms of the science to be able to convert it to an actual usable product or as you say a white powder yep now it comes out of the uh of the microbe 
once we uh, once we extract it, it comes out as a as a little white powdery flake. Now, there's a lot of purification and cleaning up that we've got to make sure that none of the residual microbes are left over. Um, and we want to get all that out of the way because that'll that'll leave discoloration and, and odors and everything else. So we want to purify that, clean all that, wash all that away, and then have nothing but the pure polymer there. Now we can take that polymer and pelletize it through a uh, you know traditional you know extrusion process, just like every other polymer runs through, and make little pellets out of it that, that can then go to a processor for uh, for manufacturing. Now we do one more step in between at Danimer uh, because PHA on its own has some interesting properties, but PHA combined with other biopolymers can have some even even better properties. Um, so we do a lot of mixing and matching. So we'll take our PHA that we manufacture and we'll combine it with other biopolymer materials. Uh, so that, that can be, you know, any of the array of, of biopolymers, PLA, PBS, uh, PBAT, starch, uh, polymerized or uh, plasticized starch, uh, PS. Uh, so there's a wide range of biopolymers that are existing in industry today that didn't exist 15 years ago, but now there's lots of different players making all these different biopolymers. Well, they all have different properties. And what we do is we take the PHA properties that we like and we combine that with some of the properties of some of these other biopolymers and we can make a, a combined property that fits really nice for say a film application or a straw application or a cutlery application or a coating application for paper or, you know, we're into, we're making lots of different, uh, of uh, polymer materials that go into the, these various uh, industrial processes, um, and and we're tailoring those those uh, formulations to fit the performance criteria that are demanded by that particular application. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that. In fact, uh, I was talking to our common friend Steve Davies, who used to be in uh, NatureWorks, and Steve was telling me about their collaboration with CJ, and they were trying to do the same thing and to reduce, increase the like what we started our discussion with, with the with the sound and reduce it to, with adding of PHA and trying to make it uh, softer, which is very very interesting. This co-polymerization idea, and um, and 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 of course you can react to that bit. But uh, also I wanted to ask you. You mentioned earlier about scalability and how that's important. When you look at a PLA versus a PHA, what do you think is more scalable quickly? Because I'm seeing the PLA plants come in the multiples of 75,000 tons kind of facilities. Do you think PHA is there already or do you think it will take a little more time for it to reach that kind of scale? PLA has certainly been at the game a little longer. Uh, they, were, they were around in the uh, mid 2000s uh, at commercial scale. Uh, I give uh, NatureWorks a you know huge pat on the back for the, the work they did and and, uh, um, and and early on in that and and now fast forward now they've expanded their production capacity they're building other plants others have come into the fold and, and building other plants and yeah that seventy five thousand uh, metric tons is a is a good size uh, facility uh, today Danimer is probably the largest producer of I think we are the largest producer of PHA in the world. And we have a plant in uh, Kentucky that's uh, producing uh, 25,000 metric tons uh, of production. That's our first commercial facility. We have uh, a plant that's being, it's broken ground on. It's a greenfield facility that we're building in Bainbridge, Georgia. Um, that will have the capacity of, of at least 50,000 metric tons, but can be uh, doubled fairly quickly. And we think that's going to be the, the scale of the plants that get built in the future. Um, so that plan is, uh, it's, we've broken ground. We've got some concrete down, got some pipes up in the air, uh, more work to be done. You know, we're probably, a, a, you know, 18 to 24 months away from, from that plant becoming commercial reality. But we're building it at the pace that, that the industry is, is wanting to buy PHA materials. So uh, uh, the goal is to, you know, sell out this first plant but have the next plant started and coming up to speed as the demand for these materials come on and then, uh, and then we'll grow from there. But it ought to be, it ought to, we ought to be able to build similar size plants uh, to the PLA uh, commercially. We think that's very, very viable and those are good sizes. But again, compared to polyethylene or polypropylene, all of us have a long way to go before we, yeah. we're going to build a lot of those plants <laughs> before we get to the size of, of a polyethylene plant. <laughs> 
No, but it's good that we are at least talking above fifty thousand, which is a which is a decent capacity. Wow. You know, like even as a as a cellulose kind of background, it's okay. You know, like once you are in that range of fifty to hundred thousand, you 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 are making a dent in that pile at least. You know, that is starting to and like you said, it's not just PHA. There's a lot of copolymerization, so you can mix things and then and, and create. Uh, new uh, substrates and that could create a higher volume as well are there are there things apart from pha uh, that you are excited about when you look at a pha blending compounding copolymerization you know i'm seeing a lot of interesting like you mentioned interesting substrates developed i was at this beautiful conference every year that happens in london called rethinking materials mm -hmm. and they were they were talking about uh, lots of the people there were talking about seaweed of course, I don't know much about seaweed, but it was interesting to see that uh, the beautiful creations that were there from seaweed was interesting, even though they were at the genesis kind of stage, but still, you know, it will evolve. So have you tried novel materials like that? And what are you most excited about when it comes to copolymerization? Yeah, like I, uh, like I said, I think Danimer's real um, achievement, I mean, making PHA is important. So that's a big base uh, load. But but I think the real achievement is taking that and combining it with other biopolymers uh, because that's where the real uh, innovations are going to take place. And, um, and I think, um, you know, new materials that are coming on stream like these, uh, you know, seaweed type of uh, or based compounds, these are, uh, these are going to be um, polysaccharide type materials. I'm trying to think of the, uh, the, the, the classification of polymers that they're in, but, but they're, they're unique materials by themselves. But I think they're going to probably benefit from mixing and matching that material with other biopolymers to get the performance criteria that's going to be needed for various, uh, you know, commercial applications. Um, I think PHA will be a, a, a component potentially uh, of some of those blends. Um, I think some of those uh, materials are, are very exciting. I, uh, you know, I can't tell you all the details of who we're talking to and where we're at, but but we're certainly exploring any and all. Uh, biopolymers that are uh, that are available on the market today, either at at scale or at emerging scale, coming um, and, and you know just to the pilot phase now, and and so we're exploring the use of those um, and where it makes sense. We're you know mixing and matching and putting together formulations. Our goal is to supply a biopolymer that works. Um, if it contains PHA, great. But if it contains other materials, that's okay too. We'll we'll just make in the we just want to make the, the compound that works for the environment or the application that it needs to go into. Yeah. And that takes me well into, I was going to ask you more about the products and usages. And you said literally like it's a biopolymer and it can be used in a variety of uh, applications, but are there applications that you find are more akin uh, to, to the properties that PHA brings? Um, and what, what are the applications that excite you most today? The attributes that, that, that PHA and many of the other biopolymers bring to the table is that end of life. Um, that differentiates them from the conventional polymers that are there today. We can match the properties. The properties that people are looking for for, for products, there's not a large deficiency in properties that people are looking for. You know, you can make things that are tough. You can make things that are flexible. You can make things that are stretchy. You can make things that are rigid. We can make all those things from all the various polymers that exist today. But most of those polymers will stay in the environment if they leak into the environment forever they will be there 50 100 years from now uh, and we know that's true because scientists have shown us you know plastic parts that wash up on a beach that they can go back and carbon date and figure out oh that part was made in 1960 you're like well how the you know how you know it's, it's been around that long and floating around in the environment you know with a with the chance of a fish or a you know an animal eating it and and then not being able to digest it. Uh, those are problematic. PHA and other biopolymers, you know, that, that, that work well in the environment, they will biodegrade, uh, some faster than others. And so putting together those right recipes of, of products that, that will disappear in the environment, that's the key attribute. But matching the performance criteria that are needed for the various applications is, that's, that's, that's a baseline. You have to do that, or you can't, you can't participate in that market. And then delivering that end of life option is where the uh, these materials uh, come into play, um, and then getting that cost down to a point where people can afford to make the switch 
is the next big hurdle and challenge that has to be overcome. And all of that comes with, you know, just size and scale. Um, all of us are kind of small by comparison, but we're growing. And as we continue to grow, the cost will continue to get better and better. So it's good that all these materials and all these other people are starting to come into the biopolymer production world, right? Because that drives competition, that drives pricing, that drives uh, uh, adoption of these materials. Absolutely. And let me, let me take you back full circle to where we started this conversation, which was the PepsiCo, you know, crackly <laughs> PLA bag. Uh, if you go back to your first love of flexible packaging and creating that, how do you see that panning out coming in the future? If you were to create a potato chip bag today and looking at all the aspects and that could be shelf life and cost and WVTR and OTR and seal strength, all that you know today, Brad, uh, you know, what would your configuration be now or what would you veer towards and where is that going to go? What, because I just feel that is the biggest problem to crack. You know, we can ban all the plastic bags, but when you look inside, it's all flexible packaging. And that's going to that's even better engineered than any of the base single layer kind of polymers. So, so you know, yeah. And people like you have to guide the industry on how to go and where to go. So how are you seeing it today after whatever, 15 years of that first material? That's, a, that's, a, that's, the, that's the goal, right? Is to, 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 to start to set a new pathway that people can start to march down. You know, and if you're on this one path and you can nudge it and get people to switch a little bit, you know, eventually you wind up in a different spot than if you were just staying on the same pathway, which if we stay on the same pathway, we're going to, we're going to create a lot of you know, materials that, that are eventually going to, some of them are going to leak into the environment. There's just, there's just no way to stop that. There's just too many of us on this planet earth, you know, and you can't control everybody's actions. <laughs> but, uh, but if you can put things into the environment that if they do leak into the environment, they won't persist. And that's a, then that's a positive. So, you know, I'll show this because I, I show this a lot as one of my examples. This is, this is a package that we've been creating. And we partnered with a few different companies uh, to create uh, the films and then buy some of the films. And it's actually, you know, some of the names are on the back. So we, we worked with a company to take some of our material, create a film, metalize that film, get the barrier performance out of that film, the ceiling performance out of that film, that we can create a package. Now, if you look at that package, what does that look kind of like? You know, that could be a, a snack bar, right? Or a candy bar or a, uh, or a nutritional bar right? Type of package. Uh, that could also be shaped into a pillow bag that could be a potato chip bag. Um, but that utilizes, you know, different materials. It utilizes cellulose as part of the, uh, of the structure combined with some PHA in the film. So it's multiple layers, just like today's multi-layer packages are today, but different, all biodegradable materials. So if this package were to leak into the environment, it would biodegrade. If you wanted to take it and throw it in your home compost, you could you could compost it in your backyard. If you wanted to send it, to, if you have availability for industrial composting, you could send it to an industrial compost facility and they could compost it and they wouldn't have any problem with it. I think what we're trying to do is demonstrate the various possibilities for utilizing materials, mixing and matching those. Um, I hope to be able to show you six other types of examples like this in the very near future. Uh, we're working on those right now. Uh, of various constructs, of various different materials put together, some of it PHA, some of it other biopolymers. But I think mixing and matching those things, you get the final structure. And oh, it, it's nice. Yeah, definitely lower, lower track. It's really quiet <laughs> and, and very soft yeah. and very flexible, yeah. very tough material too. Um, so, and it's got great barrier properties and good seal properties. Um, so it, it's very achievable. We know we can do it. And we know we're working That's with a lot amazing. of partners right now in the industry that, that know how to make these materials and how to manipulate our resins into a finished format um, that we're super excited about. Um, you know, one of my favorite companies that I love to, uh, to talk about, this is one of our favorite customers. Um, okay. Right here. They, and what does this company do? They made a great play on the word uh, PHA, D-E. Fade. Aha, uh -huh. get it um, now. Fade. And okay. um, so it's Wincup. Wincup is the manufacturer and they make straws. So inside this package is a bunch of straws. 
Uh, come on out. There it is. So there's a straw, one of their straws. And it's made, it's looks, looks and acts and just like a traditional plastic straw. They made it. And you don't have to have the paper kind of <laughs> straws with just kind of uh, <laughs> with it away. Right. So you can put it in your, you know, thick, um, you know, um, uh, mango lassi, which is one of Slashy, yeah. Right? Lassie, yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it won't collapse on you. It'll hold up. And then if that straw, you know, fell out, you know, you're on the beach and it falls on the beach, it will biodegrade. It won't, it won't persist in the environment. Um, you know, obviously you want to dispose of it properly, but if it does happen to, you know, leak into the environment, it won't persist forever. And it still performs just like a traditional plastic straw would and gives you all that performance and, you know, uh, consumer satisfaction. Um, and they did a really nice job of making it this really pretty aqua marine blue, really pretty. Um, they did a nice job with marketing this and telling a story about it. And um, so they're one of our favorite customers. So those are some of the applications that I think are going to be important. Single use applications where people are going to use it for a short period of time and then they want the package to disappear. So back to my CEO, former CEO's question, Indranui, of I want to develop a package that when the consumer is finished eating the product inside, it disappears. Those are the types of applications that I think are going to benefit from these types of materials. Short use. Uh, protect the product inside and then dispose of it properly. But if it happens to leak into the environment, it won't persist and cause problems uh, for the, for the rest of, uh, you know, generations to come. And it's amazing. And I'm sure, uh, I hope that Indira will hope that Indira knows that you're continuing the work that she kind of initiated and, <laughs> and put you on the path too. So you mentioned this, and I want to explore this a little further in terms of cellulose plus. So if I look at um, the paper kind of uh, domain, which uh, which which has is working with numerous barriers, uh, the challenge that I see is actually WBTR. It's the moisture uh, transmission. The OTR, you know, can be handled by numerous biopolymers today, uh, but when we look at WBTR, you still have to go in and metallize it. And yes, once you metallize it, yes, you can you can get to um, handling the moisture as well. Do you see a way out of that? Because I have at least seen numerous possibilities emerge with PHA because it tends to hold the moisture a little bit better. Do you see a hope of removing the metallization? And why I ask that is because not only does it become compostable, but it becomes more easily recyclable in the paper stream. That makes it you know, doubly wonderful. Yep. So because because lots of the consumers won't know where to throw the package, but if it feels like paper, they're probably going to throw it in the paper stream, which will probably make it easier overall. So how do you see that evolving? No, I think uh, I think PHA is going to have a uh, um, play a big role in the uh, paper coating uh, market. Um, now, the moisture barrier app needs for some of those markets are going to be you know, at a point where PHA can perform well enough. Um, you know, um, there's different levels of performance that are needed for different applications, right? Um, so if you're looking for something with a super, super high uh, moisture barrier, you're probably going to have to metallize it or some other type of ceramic coating onto the surface in order to get that barrier performance. But you can get a significant amount of barrier performance, moisture and oxygen barrier, just with PHA by itself. And that's going to be good enough for many markets, okay, um, and many applications. And that's certainly an area that we're exploring right now uh, as well. Uh, a lot of paper coating applications, um, grease resistance and moisture resistance are important in a lot of those. Um, again, back to a lot of single use type of packaging products, uh, food contact, um, food service items you know, where they're going to need to be used for a period of time. They need a certain amount of moisture barrier and they need a certain amount of grease barrier. Um, and, and PHA seems to be performing very well uh, in that. And, the, and, it, and it works well with the paper recycling stream because it doesn't uh, gum it up as much as uh, traditional polymers do. Uh, that's the problem with, with a lot of the uh, coatings that go onto paper today. Paper, paper is a great product and has a, has a certainly a big place and, and it's been around for you know thousands of years right um, and you don't see it persisting in the environment right because people have been making paper since the Egyptians right who were making paper and and yet you don't see these things persisting in the environment because they, they naturally break down but if you coat them with enough plastic polyethylene 
so that they actually perform in some of these other applications, they will persist in the environment because it's mainly polyethylene. But if you can substitute that for a biopolymer like PHA, and we've got some grades that, that work very well in those applications, you can coat the paper and now get the barrier performance you're looking for, the seal performance that you need, the uh, grease resistance that you need, and, and then make a paper-based product with a polymer that will also biodegrade in nature or go through the recycling process more easily than the traditional conventional polymers will. Uh, two more questions from there. So when we look at paper, there is no such thing as just paper, right? There's so many different kinds of papers. And does that make a, that, does that play a role? Or is it all, all the barrier, is it coming from the biopolymer? Or it matters whether I use a grease proof paper versus a, a craft versus a writing printing or something or the other? Uh, does the paper also make a play a role in uh, porosity or, or, or the barrier creation, or is it all biopolymer? First question, and the second one I see as a as an impediment again is the conversion process, is the runnability, because people are so used to, and I'm sure you faced it 15 years back as well. Uh, the converters are so used to running their machine as say 200 meters per minute, so many bags per minute, or something like that. Uh, so, yeah. So how do you see both those things? What is what is an ideal kind of paper and how does runnability play? Can it run at the same kind of uh, speeds that the converters are used to? Because otherwise, again, it adds to the cost. Yeah, you're certainly right about the, uh, the differences in paper. There's a wide range. and I'm not a, a paper expert, but what I do know about paper making process is, you know, you need pulp, um, some type of cellulosic pulp from from some you know lumber uh, processing uh and that can be everything from bamboo to, you know, cedar to, you know, uh, pine, you know, you name it. So there's all different types of wood pulp that are available and they make different types of, of, uh, of, of cellulosic strands. Those have to be bound together somehow in order to hold them into a paper format. And everything from simple starch binders, which would be biodegradable, to, you know, acrylic binders and all kinds of chemistry can go into making those um, um, uh, paper substrates, including some of the, you know, you know, more suspect type materials like PFOSs, these fluorinated polymer materials, which offer great barrier performance, but then there's an environmental hazard to them. Um, and, and, and those can all go into the paper making process. So yeah, your paper, paper is not paper. You know, every, there's thousands of grades of paper. So it's really working with your paper supplier to figure out you know, what's the most environmentally friendly paper that they would produce? And then how do you get the performance either through the binders they use and in combination with the coatings that could be applied? You know, those are synergistic effects that you're going to need to work with. So it it is a, you know, it's not a simple answer. It's going to be a identifying the right paper people to work with as well as the right coating sub you know materials to work with and then matching the two up so that you get the right performance and end of life scenario that you're looking for and what do you think of runnability in the conversion process because the converters are used to running these p kind of films which have a certain tensile strength do you see that as a challenge or has that been a challenge in the past when you've actually tried to play with it oh i mean it will be but uh but i've also you know we've done enough at least initial experimentation that show that you know, that can be overcome and that can be worked with. Um, but it's going to be working with the right, uh, you know, uh, product manufacturers and, and within their systems that are willing to bend a little bit and, and you know, and adjust their equipment and, and work on things. But I, but I think it's a very achievable. Um, um, you know, there's work to be done. I'm not saying that there's I can point to one application today that's in the market that I would say, oh, yeah, there's where they've done it. But I think they're starting to become that. There's a lot of uh, uh, players that are working in this area. Uh, Mars is made, you know, they're, they're, and they're one of the partners that we work with today on developing next generation packaging for them. Um, and they are also working on paper substrates. They That's public knowledge. They, they talk about it a lot. Um, and I know that they're working to try to resolve, um, you know, those types of uh, runnability and, and performance issues. And I think, PHA will play a role in helping them with some of those uh, performance issues uh, and while maintaining the end of life, uh, uh, in, you know, um, uh, circumstances that they're looking for as well. 
taking it towards uh, closure now, <laughs> but uh, but let's look at cost. Uh, so you mentioned that slowly the cost is kind of evolving and we are getting to a place where there can be, you know, PHA can be competitive with other polymers that have already existed. But what I also see, Brad, in terms of cost, it's not a straight line. It's not kilo per kilo, right? So in the end, what will the buyer look at? Say, if you were packaging a chocolate or a potato chip, you would ultimately go down to per square meter in the end, you know, or per square foot, whichever whichever matrix you use. Uh, so is it also, do you also see, when, when you're looking at PHA, do you also see the cost matrix, not just as per kilo of uh, a, a plasticizer or, or a pellet, uh, but also as ultimately, if you can reduce the amount of coating, you can also get to the cost. And where are we now? And how close are we? Because I find that there may be a sweet spot that people are ready to pay more, but how much more is the question? So again, just reframing the question is, you know, what is the sweet spot? How much more do you think people are willing to pay? And then how do you look at reducing the cost to get to that level where there may be readiness to accept a new polymer? Yeah, it's a it's an ongoing um, um, search without a doubt. How do we how do we get the you know cost to a point that people can afford it? But at the same time, you got to sell what you got because, and, and that's because that's what you got today, and and so it is finding those areas where people can accept the cost so that you can then you know move the material you got, grow more capacity, and then get to a better position on cost, uh, and it's just finding those right applications uh, you know that can absorb that that extra you know hit, if you will, where consumer demand will overcome the cost and. And, you know, you can uh, you can afford to do it. Um, I found it interesting that that straws became a, you know, a launching point, because how much do you pay for a straw when you go to a restaurant? Nothing. I mean, it's, it's a freebie. But because there was such an environmental outcry and, and a banning of, of, of these materials and then the alternative became something that was non acceptable for consumers, this paper straw that just disintegrates before you can finish your drink. Um, so, you know, if you can, if you can find places where there's an environmental demand and, a and a, um, um, you know, the other costs to society are being, you know, counted towards the total cost, then all of a sudden you can start to equal the playing field a bit. I think we're there. I mean, you know, the straw application has certainly demonstrated that, or we wouldn't be selling as, as much resin into the straw market as we are today. Um, I think uh, other areas are going to follow suit behind that, other food service areas. And then I think behind that will become the, uh, the fast, quick uh, use materials like, uh, you know, snack foods and, and uh, you know, candy wrappers and, you know, short use uh, packaging, flexible packaging. Th those will follow soon after that. So all these are going to start to follow like a domino effect. And then with that will become volumes and with that becomes cost effectiveness. And so it just all builds and builds and builds to the point where it becomes palatable. Will it ever get to the point where it's as cost effective as polyethylene? I mean, I, yeah, polyethylene and polypropylene have had, you know, they've been made since the 50s, you know, at large scale. Uh, yeah, that's 75 plus years of production time. I mean, you know, we're, we're, you know, PLA has been at it since the mid 2000s. We've only really started commercial operations in the past three years. And I take two of those years away because they were COVID years and nobody was doing very much at all from a development standpoint. So, you know, all these technologies are fairly new. Uh, these seaweed, they're just now coming out of the, they're just still in the pilot phase. They're really not at large scale yet. So, I mean, all these are new emerging technologies. They're going to take a little while to develop, but, but I think over the next decade, we'll, we'll see this uh, and we'll see uh, uh, some shifts and, and but it'll happen, you know, bit by bit. Bite by bite, right? How do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. <laughs> <laughs> One bite at a time. Uh, yeah, and also the other addition in the petroleum-based substrate is that it, it is a co-product or it's a side product or it was a waste product. And that also helps them cost it differently. You know, ultimately they are trying to sell petrol or diesel, you know, the fuel. And then, of course, uh, this has become an important part of their portfolio. Yep. But it's still a side a co product. It's not the main product, I guess. That also makes a difference. Uh, getting to competition, 
um, when when I look at PHA, it's really growing. You know, I see the Chinese, the Blue Edge PHA, the Koreans coming in, um, Tanimer and then the original RWDC uh, in, in, in North America. Then there are many of these little kind of shops that are at Pilot and moving along. How are you seeing the evolution there? And is there is there going to be a big surge in this uh, market with so many people trying to come in or it's more complicated than that uh, and it's going to there, there'll be a lot of closures as well along the way how do you see it um you know um i'm not a stock analyst um uh, or I'd, I'd be sitting somewhere else um uh, hard to say i mean i think i think there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers there's no doubt about that there always is in every industry um you know there's going to be people that 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 make it through the you know, that, that inflection point, that growth phase, there's a lot of people at that early point where they're just starting to make material. Um, you know, like I say, we're the largest manufacturer of PHA. We're at 25,000 metric tons. Um, I, I was at the, uh, the, uh, the PHA conference uh, this past fall, and a lot of the different companies got up and, and, you know, talked about their capacity. And I don't think I heard anybody more than 5,000 metric tons. Um, so you add them all together. I mean, there's not a hundred thousand metric tons of capacity out there. Um, and, and most of them are small, like, you know, a thousand at a time. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, people have got to get through that, that growth phase and, and there will be some that fall off. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, there'll be some that probably wind up combining with others. Uh, I would imagine. Um, one of the things that I'm excited about in this industry is, we all know that if we can be successful, all of us will, will grow. And um, so there's a spirit of, uh, you know, I won't say, um, what, what was the term I heard? Uh, Co-opetition. So we're sort of cooperating with one another. That's an interesting, yeah, interesting term. Yeah, we're, we're correct. We're, co co we're cooperating with each other so that we can all win. And, and everybody wants to see others, you know, be successful. Um, and, and I think that's a good spirit to have right now. I mean, we all need to grow. There's, there, we're all tiny and there's a ton of market space for all of us. So we're not we're like, we're not like we're still in somebody's, you know, breakfast, uh, by, by getting some business. Uh, it just opens the door for more business. If somebody gets, you know, a piece of business, then, then there'll be other doors that open and then there'll be plenty of business for all of us. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, hopefully the, the ones that, that create the best products will survive. And, and figure out how to manufacture their products at the at the most cost effective way. Just you know, traditional economics, right? Are going to win out eventually. I hope I hope the best for all of my competitors. I, I really want to see. Oh, no, absolutely. And it and it's great to hear that the PHA manufacturers are meeting because that will create numerous synergies and you know possibilities and like you said, cooperation uh, will happen, which is great because collaboration is definitely way better than just kind of especially in a nascent industry where things are still evolving, there's enough market out there uh, for people. So I'm glad that that is happening. So if you look at, if, if you put the uh, Brad long-term lens on and then you look at five years down, what would be your hope for the industry and for Danimer uh, in terms of scale or in terms of uh, the kind of products? How do you see that? What is your dream five years hence? Five years from now, there's, uh, you know, three world-class production facilities, you know, up and running, you know, around the globe, um, hopefully with Danimer name on some of them um, and, uh, and, you know, plans to build 10 more, um, you know, five years from now. And 10 years from now, there'll be, you know, 15 of those plants operational uh, around the globe. And, uh, and other biopolymers are growing at a similar rate. You know, that's, that would be a great vision to see come to light. That is wonderful. Well and succinctly put. <laughs> uh, okay, my final question, Brad. What is good garbage to you? Good garbage is, is you know, nature has a way of making things. There, there's a use for something. Somebody else finds a use for it, right? I mean, um, you know, an elephant takes a, you know, relieves himself and leaves a massive pile. And a dung beetle comes along and chews it up. And then microbes come along and eat it all up. And then there's no more dung left over, right? So, you know, it, it, it doesn't persist in the environment. So something has a home for something else. So good garbage is garbage that finds a way to be utilized uh, in nature um, in, in a positive way. 
Super. Thank you, Brad. This has been a fascinating conversation. I told Alex earlier in the day that this is going to be a masterclass for me, and it truly has been. You've been such an inspiration for me personally, and I know for a lot of people in the industry. You've been a trailblazer who came in way before the time, and you've been a guide. And I know that you're a good teacher to people who are coming in the future. Thank you for the work you do, and thank you. Our, our industry is truly blessed to have you amongst us. Thank you so much, Brad, for being on the show. Well, Ed, thank you very much for the invite. Really pleasure talking to you today. Uh, really enjoyed it as well. And it's time for me to go have a, uh, a cold drink. Uh, my throat is hurting. <laughs> Long time. <talk. laughs> Perfect. <laughs> thank you for listening to the Good Garbage Podcast. Follow us on social media to never miss an episode. Links are in the description below. I'm your host, Ved Krishna. See you next time.